Good afternoon, I am Andrea Suarez and I will be administering today's webinar. Thank you for joining our webinar today entitled Cultivating a Sense of Belonging with Inclusive Leadership, Why Workplaces Need to Move Beyond Diversity and Inclusion. Before we begin, this webinar has been approved by the HRCI, the Human Resource Certification Institute, and SHRM, the Society of Human Resource Management. Attendees interested in receiving recertification credits from HRCI and or SHRM Please note the completion verification code that will be provided to you midway through the presentation. Following the presentation, all attendees will receive an email from SHIFT requesting the verification code supplied during the presentation. To receive HRCI and SHRM credit, please reply to the email request and include the code in the body of this email. Once we have verified your attendance, we will email you your certificate. Now, I would like to introduce you to your presenters, Lindsay Johnson, founder and CEO of FitPros. FitPros is a global health and fitness service provider headquartered in California that brings well-being programs to companies through physical movement and mindful education. Lindsay will be joining Catherine Nook Freeman, co-founder and president of Shift's HR compliance training. Shift is an e-learning company headquartered in New Jersey that partners with organizations of all sizes and industries to deliver thought-provoking, engaging, and interactive e-learning solutions to meet changing compliance, diversity, and inclusion, in HR training needs. We are very excited about this dynamic discussion to help cultivate a sense of belonging where your employees can all thrive and work to their full potential. I will now let Catherine and Lindsay take it over. Catherine? Thanks, Andrea, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, depending on whether you're on the West Coast, East Coast, or somewhere in between. As Andrea mentioned, my name is Catherine Nook Freeman, and I've been the co-founder of Shift HR Compliance Training, or I should say I still am, I am the co-founder. Um, I've been an employment lawyer and still am for 26 years and counting. So it's been a great combination, the two businesses, my substantive expertise combined with e-learning best practices in that regard. And as you can imagine, starting Shift HR Compliance Training was a natural progression after having accumulated years of employment in HR and d &I experience. and experience. And really, the, the company shift came about because clients started to ask for training beyond instru instructor-led training. They, they loved the instructor-led training that I and my firm would um, engage their managers and their executives in. But when you're an employer with 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 employees, maybe even a few thousand employees, it becomes administratively difficult to really scale important subjects related to human resources and DNI across the entity if you're trying to do it all in person. So when my business partner and I couldn't find other e-learning um, companies that offered the type of interactive training that we thought really uh, was as, as acceptable and as engaging as our instructor-led training, we decided to start Shift. And so we work really hard with our clients and with, with prospective clients to to build all sorts of training programs for our clients, everything from the mandated preventing harassment and discrimination e-learning courses to courses on combating unconscious bias or civility and respect in the workplace, or similar to the topic that we're going to be addressing today, building an inclusive and upstander culture. So, Okay, sorry, we were just having a technical issue. Some people weren't hearing us. So please definitely get in and add your comments. If you can't hear, definitely add your comments and we'll work on it from a from the technology perspective. But I think we've got everybody on board now. So I'll continue. Anyway, last final statement. So our goal at Shift is really to help employers grow their culture, build a better workplace through this type of interactive e-learning as well as otherwise. And I'm really excited for Lindsay Johnson to join me today on this um, co-hosted webinar. And so, Lindsay, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Awesome, thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you for dealing with me today in this little cold, I'm kind of, I sound like Kermit the Frog. So <laughs> thank you for allowing yeah. me to be part of this. I'm really excited. Um, yeah, a little bit about me. So I worked as a, a, a corporate marketing director for well over a decade and I was nearly 30 pounds heavier back then. I was very unhappy and mentally unhealthy. And um, and then I, in 2013, I just hit a wall. I, I hit a wall and I said, I'm done. I can't deal with this anymore. 
And so I went on a um, yoga retreat and I woke up out of a meditation and I said, I'm going to become a personal trainer and a yoga teacher. That's it. I don't care. <laughs> and so I did that. And um, let's see, about six months later, I found myself in India uh, for yoga teacher training. And then a few months after that, I did a um, health coaching school. And so um, for about two years, I um, just found this new health and, and passion and built connections in the health and fitness space while learning the tools to really dig myself out of bad situations. And so, um, so then in 2015, my youngest brother passed away in a car accident. And when that happened, I, I, just, I went down a downward spiral for a couple months. And um, thankfully, it was because of the, the tools that I had learned in yoga that helped me dig myself out of that and say, okay, I have a greater purpose in this world. And, um, and then I, skipping ahead, went to Asia. And, and it was in Asia that I, that I learned that my brother is always with me. And meanwhile, I started writing a business plan. And this business plan was connecting my background of being that very unhappy person in the workplace, not knowing where to look for the tools combined with my new passion of health and fitness. And so that's where, where Fit Pros started. And I launched Fit Pros in 2016. And we are a global workplace wellness service provider. Our goal is to, bring, to make well-being accessible to people where they're spending the most time, and that's at work. So we work with benefit teams as well as learning and development groups to help them design on-site programs that are well-rounded in a variety of engaging activities that offer a little something for everyone. And this, this topic of inclusion, how leaders impact the culture, is just such a critical component to the success of any well-being program. So I'm so excited to be here because without proper training and thoughtful planning, it doesn't matter how much money benefit teams throw at an HR or at a, a well-being program, it just won't be successful. So thank you so much, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, there's so many different components to workplace wellness, right? There's physical well-being and there's emotional well-being and really inclusion mm -hmm. contributes to, um, to, to certainly emotional well-being and, and beyond. So great. Well, let's get started with uh, the program today. We've got uh, a full deck and we will, cover, we will cover as much as we can in the next hour. So just a quick overview of what Lindsay and I will be covering. We're going to talk about why inclusive leadership is important, really the business case for it. So many of us on the phone, this is really preaching to the choir because we all know why inclusive leadership is important, but sometimes it's nice to have helpful statistics and um, bases for our business partners who may need more persuading to understand why this is a critical imperative for every organization. We're also going to talk about how inclusive leadership can create a sense of belonging and belonging as we as a experienced HR and D&I professionals know is really the, the new frontier. It's not just D&I anymore. It's, it's really D&I and E and D, &E, belonging, creating that sense of belonging. We'll also talk about the best practices for inclusive leadership, what all leaders should be thinking about, what all leading corporate citizens should be thinking about. We'll address microaggressions and microaffirmations, and then we'll address building an upstander culture. So what is inclusive leadership? It's really leaders who actively advocate for an inclusive culture by treating all employees with respect and valuing employees' different strengths and perspectives. So it's not just valuing the same, valuing the fit, but it's really valuing the ad, the ad to the organization. So what's the business case for inclusive companies? Again, you know, we, we're all on board, but there are reasons well beyond doing the right thing for including inclusion and belonging and diversity as a business imperative. So here's some really interesting statistics. Companies in the top quartile for ethnic and cultural diversity on executive teams are 43% more likely to have industry-leading profitability. So that's significant. Companies with three or more women in senior management functions score higher in criteria such as leadership, direction, accountability, coordination, and control, all factors that lead to a successful organization. Third bullet, companies with two or more women on boards of directors 
are 22% more profitable and outperform their sector in terms of returns on equity, operation results, and stock price growth. Um, and I have a funny story there. I recently elected to my first publicly traded board of directors. And at the first meeting after the election, you know, millions and millions of shareholders cast their vote. The 11 existing board members had a chuckle as, as I walked into the room and they announced that I had received the most votes of anyone else on the board. I was the only woman. The other 11 were men. And I'm sure it wasn't because I was more qualified. Many of them had been involved in the industry and on the board for years. But I think more people now are aware of the statistic that boards are 22% more profitable if they have women on the boards. And so people may have seen my name, saw that it was a female name, and voted for me even though they didn't know me from a hole in the wall. Um, uh, fourth bullet, 67% of job seekers said a diverse and inclusive workforce is important when considering job offers. So that is really key because for companies who want to be the go-to employer of choice, which we all want to do, especially in a shrinking labor market of knowledge workers, we want to make sure that we're giving the people what they want. If our job seekers want to see a diverse and inclusive workforce, we better make sure that we're a diverse and inclusive workforce if we want to get the best candidate. Um, some additional uh, bases for, for building inclusive leadership, inclusive companies. Essentially, inclusive climate and leadership lead to increased job performance, satisfaction, intentions to stay, employee creativity, as well as employee willingness to help and mentor each other. And I know as a, as a co-founder and somebody who runs two business organizations, that's absolutely essential in both of my organizations, all of those things. Teams with inclusive leaders are 17% more likely to report that they're high performing, 20% more likely to say they make high quality decisions, and 29% more likely to report behaving collaboratively. It's hard to argue with any of that. Who doesn't want high performing employees who make good decisions in a collaborative way? It really is, is a no brainer in so many different ways. Um, in terms of the business case from an employee perspective and not just a corporate perspective, Every individual really needs to see and understand their role in company culture. And every individual needs to be empowered to act as an advocate of the culture. And I know that's what we do in my organizations. We want everybody to have a good understanding of our core values and how diversity and inclusion and belonging relates to that. And we want people to advocate for that culture because when employees feel like they belong, then that's when they work to their full potential and they can really live to be their authentic selves. As I mentioned in the beginning, belonging is really the new frontier. It's the next step in the corporate diversity and inclusion initiative because without belonging, um, you really lack that concept of fully recognizing and more importantly, accepting employees for their unique ability. So diversity is really, do you have different people with different abilities? And inclusion is, are you including those people? But belonging is, do you really recognize and more importantly, accept everybody because of their unique abilities? Because again, when employees feel like they belong, they feel more confident to represent themselves authentically and share ideas since they really get the sense that their input is valued. Lindsay, Absolutely I'll let you right. take it from here. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, a sense of belonging is just, it's not the same feeling as feeling similar to everyone else. Our, our desire to fit in often compels us to, to hide who we really are. So belonging is when you feel safe and valued for embracing what makes you different. So by providing an opportunity for colleagues to connect outside of their day-to-day -day allows them to ignite that connection, which will stem from common interests or, or from differences um, that will enable the meaningful conversations. Uh, employers can really cultivate relationships through social wellness programs that, that will bring people together. And they can do that in a, in a not forced fun way, but more in a thoughtful, uh, in, the, in the social programming that resonates with employees' lifestyle needs. As you mentioned, the data really proves that when we feel mentally and physically well, we're not only more productive in our work output, we're more likely to be receptive to the ideas that other people have to contribute. And, and one more positive, 
when, when there is a social culture that employees can hold each other accountable, just show up for the activities that the employer plans. For example, people will be a lot less likely to skip out on something if, they're, if their colleagues are waiting for them to attend the lunch and learn or the fitness class. So, so belonging is just it's imperative. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think of even like in my personal life, it's so much easier to stick with an exercise plan when yeah. I have at least one or two other people who are doing it with me and will hold me accountable and who we can do it together or, a, you know, a nutritional eating plan. If if I'm the only one in my house doing it and, and I don't have others or the only one in the office, it's difficult. But when you get people together, I, that's why I think, you know, what you hit on is, is just so, it's so important. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, so, again, tying in with what we're talking about, being the go-to employer of choice, it's important to know this first fact here. In, in the last four years, the search term employee experience has increased 140% on Google. So people, applicants, employees are looking for that employee experience. And that ties in with the sense of belonging. It ties in with the, the wellness programs and all sorts of things because many employees feel those who are already perhaps with you, that diversity and inclusion alone isn't cutting it. They want to feel a part of a community and a, a sense of belonging. And the interesting thing that we need to keep in mind is that millennials and Gen, X, Gen Zers actually entering the workforce, they are the primary force craving the meaningful work and a positive welcoming environment and that employee experience. And there are statistics that show within the next five years, Millennials and Gen Zers together will comprise 75% of our workforce. So we really, if we're not already with the program, need to get with the program and need to understand what their wants and needs are because they're going to be driving the workplace in a direction that it hasn't necessarily been driven before. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. The greater majority of the workforce, like you said, is demanding a work environment that meets their lifestyle needs. One that is not only positive and welcoming, but one that gives them purpose. An environment that, that aligns with their hierarchy of needs. Traditionally, leadership teams invest in programming that supports the physiological and safety levels of this pyramid. Uh, but what lacks are the uppermost three levels from belonging and esteem and self-actualization. It wasn't until recent years that employers feel or have found that it's necessary to, 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 to release the conservative approach and that work and life can no longer be separate. I mean, it's, it's just inevitable. Work and life are just combined now. And thanks to the millennials and Gen Zers who, who, who don't agree with that, you know, previous thought conservative approach, they're, and they're, they're letting it be known. They're letting employers know, I, I need more. I need you to provide more. And so um, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that the workplace is evolving. Um, but it's, it's imperative. It's imperative for the employer to recognize that when employees feel as though they belong at work, they are far more likely to develop the purpose in their work. In turn, they'll make a greater impact while developing relationships and, and learning things about themselves along the way. So it's, it's, it's just going to improve the, work, the workplace when people when all their needs, needs are met. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking about meeting their needs, there's a recent survey um, from 2017 where employees shared what gave them a sense of belonging at work. So the question really was, what would, you, what would make you feel like you belong at the company where you work? And so, so many of these things are relatively easy things for employers to coach their managers to engage in. So this is where HR can really play an active role in working with leadership teams and training leadership teams on one, the results of this survey to really understand the mindset of employees, and then two, what action steps can we as leaders take to create this sense of belonging? So the number one response, being recognized for my accomplishments. So, I mean, how simple is that to really encourage and reinforce with leaders how important it is to recognize employees who are doing great things and accomplishing great things? You know, interestingly, some of the employers I've worked with in the past, the saying has been, no news is good news. 
So when you say no news is good news, that means people certainly aren't recognizing people for their accomplishments. They're really just, if there's news, it's really about what they can be doing better, not necessarily praising them for things that they're doing well. So that's a big one. The, the next biggest response, having opportunities to express opinions Really, and that goes to you know, do people feel that sense of belonging where they feel like their opinions will be heard and valued? Speaking of value, the next response: feeling that my contributions in team meetings are valued. Again, do you feel like you're being listened to? The next one: feeling comfortable with being myself at work. The next one: transparent communication about important company developments. And those of us. In HR, know how important, especially when your organization is going through transitionary periods, how important change management communication is. And it seems as, as, as though as hard as you try to stay ahead of the communication curve, it's really difficult. But it's important to realize that this is really important to employees, transparent communication. Or the next one, feeling like my team and company cares about me as a person. How can we make sure that our employees know that? Another one. Feedback on my personal growth. You know, at, at my at my firm, we have a saying that that feedback is love, and it, it really is. If, if you really care about an employee and want them to be the best that they can be, you're going to give them feedback about their personal and professional growth so that they really can be the best that they can be. And and millennials, more than any other generation, want it, need it, expect it. In fact. There's a survey that's done that says millennials would rather hear negative feedback about themselves than no feedback about themselves because they value feedback that much. The next one, being assigned work deemed important for the team or company. Next, having the company values align with personal values. Next, being a part of important company meetings. And then, of course, seeing executives who look like me and coworkers. Who look like me. So one of the one of the ways that my company has really dealt with this creation of a sense of belonging is we created what we call a culture club to address these types of issues. How can we create this sense of belonging across the boards and really try to uh, meet our employee needs in many different ways? And I know Lindsay, you're doing many different things with your clients as well. Yeah, yeah, I love that a culture club. I mean, that's that's, that's brilliant and. That's uh, similar to a program that FitPros offers. It's called our Wellness Warrior Program, where our a fit pro, someone with experience in health and fitness, will go into a company and help them build that internal culture. So kind of like your culture club, we can bring in an expert that will help people that, that maybe they don't know where to look for um, the ex expertise. And so um, I love that you guys are doing that. And, and another thing that came to me as you're reading through those stats is a lot, I mean, all of those stats are Recon people want to be recognized through accolades versus prizes too. Like a lot of those uh, come from in yeah. in, you know, in intrinsic motivators. It's it's less about uh, the the physical tangible things. They want recognition through verbal praise for verbal praise. So um, on this slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, social engagement. So diving a little bit more into um, how in the workplace social engagement is now a trending term that has virtually replaced team building because after many years of those cheesy rewards and those hokey challenges uh, team building has developed such a bad rap well social engagement activities allow employees to form a deeper relationship with the company and mean meaningful com com connection with their teammates um, and i put in a couple pictures there of a few great examples here so a fitness class where employees can push their personal limits to become more physically fit while being held accountable, like we talked about earlier, to meet their colleagues at a class. They're much less, li less likely to skip out. Um, the second one here is a self-defense workshop. Employees can learn how to protect themselves shall they encounter a dangerous situation while building trust with their colleagues and having fun uh, during the practice drills. And then uh, the, the third one here, employees can learn recipes and take home tips from a cooking class while they're prepping a meal next to their teammate as they casually chat about personal anecdotes. They'll start to build a bond. So countless studies show that employees who have a bestie at work are a heck of a lot more engaged and they're less likely to leave the company. And then on the flip, lonely employees are less productive 
they're more likely to quit because they're just not invested in the company or their work. Employees, they'll feel a sense of belonging and community and also feel like they're part of something that is just bigger than themselves if they feel um, part of the culture and they're, they're just engaged socially. Yeah, those are just such great ways to create the sense of belonging. I know our, our organization has done a number of them, and I couldn't agree with you more. Like the takeaway of the social engagement is really amazing. In, in terms of shifting from belonging to best practices for inclusive leadership, we've got um, a few other areas we want to talk about with the audience from really creating that culture of open communication, which we refer to in collaboration, building, further building personal connections, uh, leading with humility, keeping the big picture in mind and believing that people are created equal even if they're not the same. So starting with creating a culture of open communication and collaboration, um, it's really important as a leader, and more importantly, I know this is an audience of HR leaders and DNI leaders, that you encourage your business partner leaders to have and engage in honest and open communication and to communicate clearly and to listen and consider others' ideas with an open mind. And you know, we at our organization, our, our law firm, for example, uh, and feel so important, um, so strongly about this that we actually brought in a communications coach to help teach our leaders to be the best possible communicators that they could be and the best possible listeners. And it's amazing how far that goes. Um, it's also important as inclusive leaders to really demonstrate the caring and empathy, it help employees work through roadblocks that might exist that might be keeping them from being as successful as they can be through mentoring and training, and, and for leaders to understand that outside factors Im Im impact our employees, right? And so it's interesting. I was reading an article um, a while back that discussed only about 15% of our population is naturally born empathetic and the rest of us have to be taught it and pick it up along the way. And so the good news is there are studies that show that leaders who may not be naturally empathetic when coached appropriately by HR and others can learn to become more empathetic. And knowing how important it is in the workplace today, it's really essential that this be part of a, a manager's and a leader's role. Um, it's also important for leaders to empower their team members to speak up and to advocate for respect and inclusion when we're talking about diversity and inclusion and belonging and really for leaders to foster that culture of teamwork and um, also to provide professional development and encourage team members to really utilize their strengths. And again, that's oftentimes where coaching by human resources will come into play. Our, our HR leader often coaches our employees, again, to really help them develop professionally as both team members and as leaders within our organization. And, and we also outsource to other really helpful coaches when we feel like that's gonna be a benefit to our team members and our leaders. Awesome, yeah. There's Leadership training is just so critical. Um, and I guess I want to give a case study here, just kind of a, a good example of a fun one when you do need to turn to outsource um, is improv workshops. So um, these, are, these are so much fun. Uh, it's a great opportunity that leaders can, can take to breed the collaboration and promote communication. Um, the more that employees understand how to communicate, the more that they'll understand each other while they're collaborating. And when people can connect, communicate, and create together, they're a lot more productive, and then innovative ideas just start to spring up. So FitPro has brought this offering to a hospitality group who wanted 60 people on their leadership team who will then take those, these ideas to the individual contributors because they wanted them to incorporate more kind humor into their job and how to think on their feet with a thoughtful response when talking to their customers. So through this place, through these lots of playful exercises, there was a 90 minute workshop and, um, and lots of role play. These leaders learned tactics to take back to their teams 
and, and they had a really fun time laughing together. So improv can be a really cool way to, to just kind of change up the, the average um, leadership and development training. Yeah, I bet. That sounds great. We'll have to talk offline about that. That sounds really enticing. Yeah. <laughs> um, continuing on building personal connections, which I know is what your organization is all, is all about, Lindsay, um, some other tactics and strategies that leaders can be encouraged to take, of course, and some of these, they're not rocket science, but it's amazing, I find, how helpful it is to consistently message and remind leaders of these important um, factors. And I find, you know, I do a lot of counseling as an employment lawyer across industries. So it's the financial services industry, the legal industry, the tech industry, and some industries or the, the medical industry, some industries, the leaders need more reminders in this regard than others. So be respectful to so speaking to others as they want to be spoken to. Some leaders mistakenly follow the, go the golden rule of years past, which is treat others as you'd like to be treated. The problem is if you're somebody who has a super thick skin and just wants people to blurt things out at you and you go blurting things out at your colleagues and those who report to you, if they're not like you, they're not going to appreciate the blurting. So you really have to read and know your employees and know how they want to be spoken to, how they want to be treated and be respectful and give give the people what they want. Also, give people the benefit of the doubt. When you approach situations as a leader, you don't want to be blame-oriented and automatically jump to conclusions. You want to be solutions-oriented. You also, of course, want to be fair and equitable. We already talked about recognizing successes and giving credit. You really can't do that enough. When it's deserved, you really cannot recognize success enough. And ensuring consistent treatment. So not you, you don't want to have a situation where only certain people receive praise and recognition and not others when there are multiple people who are actually performing at a high level. And you want to make sure you consider any unconscious biases in your treatment to make sure that you truly are being fair and equitable and you, you identify any blind spots you might have. Um, it's also really important to coach our leaders today to show an interest in others. Now, some people you'll have on board are automatically people people, and you don't have to coach anybody who's a, a you know people person to show an interest in others. But there are some people who it doesn't come as naturally to, and so they might need the reminders that it's, it's really important to build rapport with employees by asking about their lives out of work on a regular basis. Um, and it's really important for leaders if they're really trying to build those personal connections to also interact regularly with employees to build trust. Because when you show that you care somebody, care about somebody, both personally and professionally, that increases the levels of trust. Um, and you really want to show them that you value your personal connections with them because those leaders who value relationships with their employees end up causing employees to value their relationships with not only the leaders but with the company as a whole and increase the loyalty to the organization and the brand and increases their engagement and also increases the likelihood that they'll stay and you won't be backfilling seat after seat because people don't feel valued. And one of the things we like to say around here is that when you're talking about building the connection with people and really establishing relationships with them and showing an interest, keep in mind that as leaders, leaders, their mood creates the weather. So if a leader walks into a room and is positive and is engaging and is caring, that's going to create a certain type of atmosphere. Whereas if a leader walks into a room and they're stressed and they're busy and they're preoccupied, that's going to create a whole different type of weather or atmosphere for the group. So it's a really important line for us to be coaching our leaders on. Absolutely right. And you know, one of the things that we hear a lot are um, companies dealing with, like, like you and I, um, remote workforces. And so um, the, the challenge that leaders now have with, with remote workforces and, and actually fit pros, we are a remote company. Our HQ is primarily based in Northern California, but we have hundreds of staff across the world. And our, our headquarters team meets in person once a week to work together, but primarily we, we work from home. 
And um, it, it's absolutely imperative to ensure that every employee feels, feels value and motivated to put the work and effort in on their own time without that constant interaction. Uh, with, with solid leadership, virtual teams can, can really be just as productive as, truthfully, in my opinion, even more productive sometimes. Um, however, mm-hmm. it does take virtual leaders a lot more um, proactive to be to motivate their remote employees. And so a couple points here, um, I won't go too deep into all of them, but um, you know, number one here, strong virtual teams are based on solid interpersonal relationships where there must be a mutual trust. We, we at the pros use tools such as Google Hangouts for two 30 minute team meetings each week. And at the beginning of each team meeting, one person is responsible to pose a question to, the, to everyone else before we start the meeting. So in, it truly only takes about five minutes where every person answers the question, but the questions are usually thought provoking or funny. And that allows us to step out of the stress that we're dealing with on our project and it allows us to see a, someone else's perspective on whatever they're going through. And so it's just a really fun conversation starter. Um, the second one here, uh, virtual leaders just shouldn't micromanage, uh, but they should check in with employees regularly. In addition to Google Hangouts, Slack is a great, uh, great tool for regular communication. And we also use Asana as our project management tool to collaborate and hand off projects. So just um, talking about a couple of tools that are super helpful for us. Um, number three here, remote employees already have the flexibility in their job, so they expect the same approach when it comes to training, making training available online and in a variety of e-learning formats, which you, you guys are the experts in. Um, and being a well, well-being company, we encourage flexible well-being programs, such as offering remote um, health talks where the remote staff can dial into. So they can call into a, a, a nutrition talk or things like that. So any company that's hosting one in, live in an office that the remote employees could call into. Um, ClassPass is also a really great tool for remote employees. Um, and then what's another, a really another uh, cool one is uh, when you're hosting an activity in, in HQ, such as a succulent workshop, uh, you can mail a succulent kit to the remote employees so that they don't feel like they're missing out. Um, given time, I won't go through three and four, but setting clear goals and measuring performance is critical, finding ways to recognize and reward employees. The number six here, nothing hinders productivity and motivation more than sitting through a virtual meeting and feeling like nothing was accomplished. So uh, I we suggest create an agenda that outlines who will cover each topic and, and really find approximately how much time is going to be dedicated to that and then move on and, and let people get into their, their work day and, and personal lives. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. So um, another strategy for, for building leaders within your organization is encouraging them to, to lead with humility and be courageous. So humility really as a leader is accepting that you can be wrong and that you may have blind spots that you're not aware of and or flaws. Um, In fact, you probably do, (laughs) everybody does. And then being courageous as a leader, being creative and forward thinking for your organization. So if we're talking about humility and, and, and being open to feedback and the potential for being wrong, it's really important to encourage an open dialogue because you know some leaders who are not humble, they never get the feedback from their team members and they never find out what the hidden um, problems may be within the organization. So you need to have that open dialogue and be open to the possibility that you could be wrong. You need to be an active listener. And when you're getting feedback, remain composed and be curious. Really be as curious as you can be. Ask questions, find out where people are coming from, ask what the basis for different thoughts are. And then of course, be thankful that somebody is sharing information with you. Because if you have somebody who's not at your level, who may be reporting to you sharing information, that's more intimidating than you might think. So that person really should be thanked for having the guts and the commitment to bring it to your attention. And one of the things that we've done in our organizations is we've really tried to create a feedback-rich culture because we believe we are all better when we get feedback, positive so we know what to keep doing, 
and constructive so we know how we can do things better. And it really takes, it takes a movement. You need to work within your organization over time to create that feedback rich culture. And it comes into play in a number of different areas and some of it really uh, requires courage. So you want your employees to have the courage to speak up and to be agents for positive change. So you don't want the complainers speaking up. You want people, if they're gonna speak up, you want them to come with solutions. You want them to come with ideas. You want them to be that agent for positive change. You also wanna encourage your team members to approach diversity and inclusion and equity and belonging wholeheartedly and be courageous about that and to hold others accountable when they may misstep, as they may. You know, none of us are perfect and people are going to make mistakes in terms of what they say and what they do. But if we all learn to approach this in a courageous and professional, solutions-oriented way, the organization will continue to evolve in the right direction. And part of that as being a courageous leader is also being aware of the individual's strengths and weaknesses and being aware of your own strengths and weaknesses as a leader and can commit to evolving along the spectrum so that you get better and better every year. Absolutely. I, I, I battle with that um, back and forth. I'm, I'm naturally a type of person that wears my heart on my sleeve. And so I kind of, you know, as leaders, we go back and forth of like, okay, how much do I share? How much do I not? And, and truthfully, in my heart, I feel that the more that people can feel comfortable around us, then the more that they can be themselves. And so I agree with your point completely. And I also, I love that you mentioned being an agent for change, because mm -hmm. to be honest, I did not know, I did not know what that meant until I read Laura Putnam's book called Workplace Wellness That Works. It's pictured here. And this is one of those books that you want to stick, you know, and highlight every line. Laura in this book shares that the first task, task to promote well-being and a culture of belonging is to persuade. And the way to do so is to shift the mindset from being an expert on everything. Leaders are in their leadership role because they are an expert, but rather shift to being an agent of change. So she says, while experts inform us and guide us, agents of change move us. Everyone in an organization can be an, an agent of change and make a difference. And the four ways that she points out to do that are one, to know your why, which also, if listeners haven't seen the Simon Sinek TED Talk, I highly recommend that. That was one of the foundations of when I started this company. Mm -hmm. um, but know your why. And behind every great agent of change, there's a strong sense of purpose. Number two is move people beyond an emotional level. As, as every advertiser and a great salesperson knows, it's the emotions that move us that in, in not necessarily facts. One of the best ways that you can appeal to emotions is by telling stories. There's an informal study that was conducted by a, a Stanford professor, and he found that five out of 100 people will likely remember a statistic, whereas 63 out of 100 people will remember a story. Uh huh. That makes so sense. then number, yeah, um, let's see, the number three thing she says here, um, make the business case. So whether you're looking to ask for budget or asking for an on, a new on-site program to enhance your culture, you must first collect the data to prove the need. And then some specific areas of your company to pull that data can include presenteeism. You know, your CFO wants to see some, some, true, some true numbers of presenteeism, safety, mental health, which your carrier or broker can help you pull the numbers, um, and then also just overall organization performance. So if you're looking for budget, those are some, some specific areas. And then the final thing here is really button down your elevator pitch. So when you're going to ask for um, any, whether it's budget or just making a, a specific change, you know, culture or change, there needs to be a, the why needs to be buttoned up in 30 seconds so that it will convince the powers that be that it is the right thing to do. So I highly recommend this book. Great. So other strategies for building inclusive leaders within your organizations. Um, you want to really encourage your leaders to, of course, anticipate the unexpected, focus on the future of the company. Um, the best organizations also reward innovation and pr 
provide all sorts of opportunities to employees to advance their careers and continue to maintain a forward-thinking approach. But while they're doing that, while they have the big picture in mind, it's also really important, and your leaders probably need more reminders along these lines, to not overlook the small things. So when leaders witness another employee or a vendor or somebody else being rude or dismissive, again, we want to empower upstanders within our organization so that they call it out and they suggest alternative ways to communicate and that they also call attention to the efforts of employees who might have been overlooked and really need more recognition. And this is another big one that very busy managers and sometimes serious managers need to be reminded of. They need to be reminded to regularly express gratitude and encourage others on the team to do the same. You know, I've sometimes heard people say, sometimes leaders, not within my organizations, but otherwise say that, why do I need to thank somebody for doing their job? It's their job. Well, if you want to keep people and you want to keep people content at a high level and producing and talking about the company and, and sharing positive ideas and thoughts, simple thank yous go a very, very long way to really growing that positive, inclusive culture, which is what we all want to do as leaders. Yeah, absolutely. And true leadership identifies the unified action of leaders and staff working together to jointly achieve those mutual goals. It, it's really it's a collaborative effort. Without, without truly caring for and understanding their people, leaders just can't lead effectively. At, at Pipros, we define leadership as inspiring people with aligned values while planning for the future through collaboration of concepts and actions to achieve, to achieve the community goal. Now, I know that's a mouthful. <laughs> so to simplify, an effective leader must be able to build relationships to create community. To do so, the leader must be open-hearted, like you described, by taking an extra step to know their people's values and their motivations. Uh, as you can tell, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote another book here. Um, I'm a big nerd <laughs> learner, um, but in the book, uh, in the, the Leadership Challenge, they say when leadership is a relationship founded on trust and confidence, people will take risks, make changes, and keep organizations and movements alive. Through that relationship, leaders turn their constituents into leaders themselves. So um, I just I just wholeheartedly believe that, you know, everything you, you said about just being being genuine and, and, and letting your, your employees know um, it's just all it, it just drives the culture. It does. It does. Um, and then the last strategy for really coaching your leaders to be inclusive leaders is to to really remind them to believe that people are created equal, even though they're not necessarily the same. So again, every person, race, gender, sexual orientation, physical ability, age, the list goes on. Every difference leads to different levels of access and privilege and has over the, over the course of a person's lifetime. So it's important for leaders as well as others to commit to boosting cultural competency, either by exposing yourself to different um, different employee resource groups by reading different articles, by watching different TV shows and movies, but expose yourself, boost your cultural competency so that you can continue to seek new perspectives and ideas and, and really celebrate the differences of your team members and of other employees within your organization because inclusive leaders are the ones who can notice and talk about differences in a respectful and professional manner. They're not afraid to you know, they don't shirk, um, shirk and, and they're not afraid to have conversations. They do it in a professional and respectful and positive way. And leaders are more successful when they actually do recognize the unique qualities and strengths that each employee brings to the table. And it ends up allowing employees to really be the, their authentic selves, which further increases morale and productivity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, here I wanted to give a couple um, uh, activities that that HR leads can can do themselves within within their company. And so um, here is 
from what one of our most popular offerings are health talks, which are also referred as, as, as lunch and learn. And this is when a credentialed speaker presents their area of expertise on a certain topic. So at FitPros, our speakers are required to perform more interactive exercises to get people talking to each other and engage with the topic. And so this activity in particular that I like on the topic of BNI is called defining moments that's shown on this slide here. So I, I very specifically outlined um, how to perform the activity. But in short, the speaker will create a safe space for employees to share about their background and, and what is vital in shaping their lives. This allows the group to learn new things about each other and, and the act of being open and vulnerable is just such a great way to form bonds and increase empathy that will improve the relationship. Yeah, it sounds like a great exercise. I'm going to incorporate that into, uh, into one of my next presentations. I love it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, I think we've talked about this a lot, but inclusive leaders really, they set a positive example for inclusive employees, and it really just spreads because employees are looking to leadership to see how they handle issues. Um, before we move to the next page, for those of you who are seeking HRCI credit, just note that the code is 220A. 220A. And then we're just going to quickly, I know we have only about eight or nine minutes left, but we're going to quickly address the area related to subtle messages. So it's really important as leaders to ask yourselves, you know, what signals are you sending by your actions and by your statements? You know, what, what, what signals is your body language sharing, your casual comments, your feedback, your environment? Um, and, and the more you are aware of it, the more you can make sure it's just as you would like it to be to create the type of inclusive um, environment with a sense of belonging and equity. And so before we get to what we want to see more of, it's important to at least address the concept of microaggressions, which are essentially their everyday verbal or nonverbal slights or insults regardless of whether they're intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile or derogatory messages to people based solely on the, that target person's marginalized group membership or their social identity, whether it's their sex, their race, their age, et cetera. And there was a recent study at Fordham University, it was a student project, which was called 21 Racial Microaggressions. And students were asked to give examples of racial microaggressions they experienced over the course of their lifetime. So we're dealing with students here. So their lifetime is 18, 19, 20 some years. Um, and it really showed the impact of this accumulation of microaggressions and not necessarily that any one of these statements was especially egregious by itself, but if a student, a person had been exposed to these statements time and time and time again for 18, 19, 20 years, it ended up creating a marginalized existence. So here are just a few examples of microaggressions from this study. So this young woman is Latina, but she doesn't speak Spanish. So she's third generation um, Latina, and she chose to speak French in high school. And yet when anybody comes, stumbles across a Spanish word and something they're reading, her friends would turn to her and say, do you know what this word means in Spanish? And her response was, no, I don't know what it means in Spanish. And then they would ask, what do you mean you don't speak Spanish? The assumption was because of the way she looked and because of her national origin, they assumed she spoke Spanish. Um, and after being asked that and commented on that time and time and time again over 19 years, it is definitely something that cr created less than an ideal experience for her. This young woman had another racial microaggression that she's experienced throughout the course of her short life. The comment, know you're white. So she's biracial and she considers herself to be as much black as she does white, but she happens to have fair skin, light eyes and lighter hair. And yet when she tells people that she's black, the comment she receives back is no, you're white. Again, discounting who she believes that she truly is and contributing to less than an ideal and a marginalized experience for her. And then one last example of the 21 that were identified during the study is this young woman, the microaggression she's experienced over the years is the, the feeling that when people think it's weird that she listens to the country music star Carrie Underwood, as if white people have the market on country music. So again, racial microaggressions might not be, or any microaggressions related to other areas as well, may not be 
you know, egregiously offensive on their face, but they, regardless of whether they're subtle or whether they're more major, they do end up creating a marginalized experience, which we don't want our employees to have in our workplaces. Mm -hmm. And that, that's exactly what this engagement, um, I, I do this often when I'm giving uh, talks at conferences, I have the audience um, participate, and this, this activity came from um, MIT, and it's a really great way to break down misconceptions and stereotypes by allowing individuals to report on uh, how they identify themselves, also while allowing them to address a stereotype that might be an identifying factor. And so on this slide, I outlined how to specifically perform the activity, but in short, you have the audience create two columns. And in the first column, you write, I am, I am words or phrases. And then in the second column, you write a list that corresponds with I am not. And so a quick example, um, I, for me, I, I am from the Midwest, but I, I'm not a NASCAR watching beer drinker. I, my, my family is, but that's not me. Right, um, right. One of my dear friends, one of my dear friends, um, Shahers, is I am Asian, but I'm not good at math. And so it's, it, you know, these are real stereotypes that that are out there, and and it by, by, by doing this in a group environment allows people to, um, even if it's built up in our head, even if you know, even if these these um, these I am not statements are just something that's in our mind. Um, it uh, by doing this in a group, it allows you to be spoken and, and and really break down walls. Yeah, that's a great exercise. That's a great one. <laughs> Um, last but not least, we're going to cover the topic of microaffirmations, and this is an area, again, where HR and D&I can really actively coach leaders. And we talk about microaffirmations at my company as their free benefits. So the definition is they're small everyday gestures that foster positive feelings of comfort, support, and inclusion, which help others feel successful and valued. So why as would we not want to share as many of these as possible if they make our employees feel more engaged, more appreciated, more productive, more likely to stay with us? And we want to see as many microaffirmations as possible. And you can have brainstorming sessions amongst your different teams to figure out what microaffirmations are we currently engaging in and are we bad and what can we be doing more of? And it's everything from attentively listening to your colleagues and their concerns and their ideas to actively seeking input, especially from those who are a little bit more quiet in the group, giving credit to others, again, saying thank you, as we said earlier, encouraging fair treatment and respect and making sure that, that nobody feels left out. And it's also important to keep in mind that microaffirmations, these subtle messages that we send, whether they're positive in the case of microaffirmations or negative in the type of microaggressions, they can show up in our branding, where they can show up in our hallways, in the posters that we have posted, in our career websites, in the job descriptions, in the benefits that we offer, and in our commitment to diversity. So it's really important that as leaders within our organization, we look at each one of these pieces and we make sure we're really communicating the message that we want to communicate in the most positive way that we are an employer that values diversity and inclusion and equity and belonging, and we walk the talk. So I know we've covered a lot in this past hour. I, I know that I have learned a tremendous amount from Lindsay and really appreciated this. Um, I would love to talk, if anybody wants to talk more about how we help employers by presenting on these topics to leadership teams on or how shift actually works with employers across the country to roll out e-learning on these subjects to make sure that it's front and center for all leaders and all employees. Just reach out and let me know. I'm sure Lindsay would, would welcome the same reach out for those who want to engage in the types of activities and, and services that her team um, does all the time for companies across the country and organizations. And we wish you all the best of luck and thank you for joining us today. As a quick reminder, to receive HRCI and SHRM credit, please reply to the email we send you and include the verification code in the body of the email. Please take a moment to respond to that to a short presentation evaluation that you will receive via email in the next hour. Thank you, Lindsay Johnson and FitPros for joining SHIFT today on this great webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either Catherine 
or Lindsay at the email address is listed in shiftdlt.com and hello at fitpros.com. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you.